one. We are seeing some uh, relief week to week from different uh, openings. They've opened some bowling alleys and uh, reduced the number of or, uh, your restriction on some of the retail places. And uh, they emphasize many times the new cases, and there are new cases. And certainly if there's, even in flu season, we say be careful, wash your hands. I mean, I think that, uh, caution is certainly okay. But I've also noticed that the uh, number of uh, hospital beds, the recoveries are up. There's a lot of numbers they don't publish that I'm encouraged by, and so uh, we pray the Lord will protect us and give us wisdom, and we try to move forward in that, but I certainly hope that we can move a little bit more each week back to some sense of normalcy as far as our church and, of course, as far as just regular life is concerned, but don't quit praying about it. Just ask God to uh, watch over us and give us wisdom as we make progress toward that. As you find your place in the book of Mark in chapter 1, I want to read here by way of a text beginning in verse 21, but right before I begin there, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we pray this morning that as we open your word, that we might, in a very real way, depend upon you to speak to our heart. Lord, we know that our need is great, and we know the Lord Jesus needs to be lifted up in our sight. So we pray this morning that all we do would bring really praise to his name as well as demonstrate to the one who needs him their need of a Savior. May you encourage every believer. We thank you for what you'll do, give you glory for it in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll notice in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, it says, They went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Are thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits and they do obey him. You probably have heard the news reports in the last several days, and I don't know all the details about it, but you've heard as well as I have that over in Seattle, a group has taken over several blocks of the city. They've declared themselves the Republic of Chaz. They've set up borders with armed guards, and they, of course, have not shot anybody that I know of yet, but they are uh, basically establishing this is our place America stole the land to start with, and of course that was awful, but they just stole it, so it was okay, and they've set up their own republic, their only only place called Chaz, and it's a place with no police, no laws, no rules. The ones that don't exist, if you break them, though, they're going to get in trouble, but uh, there's there's anarchy. Well, now, you know, to to recognize that this plate uh, is illustrated, the folly of it is illustrated, because, for instance, I heard that they had a way they were letting, uh, giving out some food items. Now, you could come get the food items. There's no cost. Everything was free. The only requirement is you had to be nice. Well, that's a rule. Anarchy is no rules. Well, they had a guard set up at the border, and the border says you can't come through except you meet these conditions. That's rules. That's a law. Do you realize the folly of saying that there is no law, that there is nobody can tell me what to do, is illustrated by a simple act like this where there's no way you can have a society and not lay down some type of authority. But do you realize in a small way in what you're seeing take place in that fiasco that is in the middle of that city is really a picture of what takes place in our society at large because our society would like to do away with authority. They just don't want to be told what to do. Now, even those who maybe are intelligent enough to recognize you have to have some restrictions and some laws to operate in an orderly way, what is greater than that is they really want to do away with God's authority. Now, if you follow it logically, if you do not have a supreme authority, there can be real no authority. You say, well, this person's in charge of me. Well, who tells them what to do? Well, then obviously they're told to do by this group of people. Well, who tells them what to do? 
You understand there has to be ultimately at some point for there to be any authority, there's got to be an ultimate authority. Well, now you well know if you're a Christian today and if you believe this book, you know that there is a final authority. And there might even some who would vaguely say, well, yes, God is in charge, but they don't really know what that means. Do you know when you sit in a college classroom today and someone talks to you about uh, morals and talks to you about absolute truth, they get up and they say, there is no absolute. I heard about one fellow who went into a college classroom and the teacher got up that day and he said, look, before we get started in this class, it was some, I don't know, philosophy or history or whatever it was, it's going to help you if you understand this principle, there are no absolutes. The guy in the back row said, sir, I've tried to take notes and it seems like that was pretty important. Could you say that again? He said, okay, I, I, it's very simple. It's not much to write down, but you need to remember it. There are no absolutes. And the guy said, I, I, think, I, I think I've got it, but it, I wasn't really clear. Would you, would you say that again? Well, the third time, the teacher got the point. He is up there claiming that day with all authority that there is no authority. And so he stopped and he says, okay, okay, there is one absolute. There is no abs are no absolutes. Well, he produces folly when you say there are no absolutes. Obviously, there are. You know, it's interesting in our news cycle today, uh, people are tearing down statues. Okay, we've got to get rid of this Confederate soldier. We've got to get rid of this. And of course, in the middle of this, they're tearing other ones down. They don't even know what they're for. And they come up and they say, well, we can't have, for instance, a, a statue of Thomas Jefferson because he owned slaves. Well, now, we don't believe in people owning slaves. But by their own definition, it was okay for him to own one because in the day in which he lived, societal norm says it was okay. Now, if you can only live by a societal norm, I go back to the time of the gladiators and they lived by the sword, so it was okay for them to just murder indiscriminately or whatever it might be. I mean, after all, they lived according to the norms of their time. You see, it is absolutely ludicrous not to think that there is an ultimate, absolute authority. Now, I think anybody who's thinking and they really get out of their college classroom and get back to normal life and recognize how things operate, they say, okay, somebody's got to be in charge. But let me answer the question this morning, who is in charge? Now, I just read a passage where Jesus came into the synagogue. He preached in that synagogue and he did not demand people's respect. He did not cry out, somebody listen to me. He did not come in and say, there is consequences if you don't. But when he got through preaching, the people looked at one another and said, what new doctrine is this? I, this man preaches like one with authority. He said he commands the, the evil spirits and they obey him. Before he ever cast out the first evil spirit or even healed in this chapter, when they heard him preach, they recognized his authority. Now, let me tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, is the authority. That uh, the Lord Jesus is the authority is established because, obviously, He is the Son of God, and God made the world, and all that in, in this world is, and He's the authority. But when it comes down to it today, I do not bodily have access to the Lord Jesus in the way they did in the synagogue. Certainly, God is in heaven. So, really, today, the authority that is on this earth is the Word of God. Amen. This Bible is an authority. Amen. It's not open for a subjective approach. It's not open to say, well, it's there. It's a historical reference. It's influenced the culture. It literally is the Word of God, and it stands as an authority over this Amen. world. Now, let me show you several things in this passage. In the way that Jesus put this, it shows us, really, that the Word of God is the final authority on this earth. I want you to notice back, first of all, the expression of authority. Look at chapter 1 and verse 9. This is the early ministry of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And note in verse 11, there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now the Lord Jesus, of course, is the Son of God. He came to this earth, born of a virgin. He is very God and robed in human flesh. Now, as he walked this earth, no one may not have known who they were dealing with, but now God establishes it 
from heaven, he said, this is my beloved son. We know that the authority, first of all, finds itself in heaven. That is, God is the authority. Now, God is the authority. He made the earth, but now he transfers and says, this is my beloved son. And of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 18, he says, hear ye him. I'm transferring that authority. He's in charge. Well, now we go down to verse 12, and it says, Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, all the details are not given in Mark. We could go over to Matthew and Luke and read the other details of his temptation, but I think you're familiar enough with the account to know this. The devil came to Jesus and he said, make this stone into bread. He said, why don't you jump off the pinnacle of the temple and demonstrate that you're God's chosen because the angels are going to rescue you. Uh, why don't you go up and, and show them all the kingdoms in a moment at a time? And he said, if you'll worship me, I'll give them you. All three times Jesus answered him the same way. He said, it is written. Now, it is written literally means it was written in the past, and it stands established today as I quote it to you. Amen. Now, Jesus, of course, is the God of heaven. Amen. When the devil came to Jesus, have you ever thought about when he tempted him, and he came and he said, make this stone into bread, that he could have, and he did when, he, uh, when Peter came and said, you're not going to the cross. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He could have supernaturally transferred Satan to the other side of the earth. He could, as he had done before, he could have transferred himself to the other side of the earth. He could have turned Satan into a frog, I suppose. I mean, he could have supernaturally acted and said, Satan, I don't have to listen to you. I'm so far above you in power that I don't even have to give you any attention. And he could have wiped out Satan. But you know what? Jesus did not choose to supernaturally defeat the devil. He defeated him with the Word of God. Amen. Now, that demonstrates something to me. The authority of God, yes, is in heaven, but now we find that God has transferred His authority on this earth to a book, and that book is the Word of God. Do you realize this book is not just something that tells us a little something about God? It's not a supplement to our knowledge of God. Everything you know about Him and everything you've been, ever been exposed to about Him is in here. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of passages. I'll give you the reference. We won't necessarily turn to all of them. To show you not only that the place of authority is in heaven, but the personification of the authority is in this book. God doesn't really separate himself from his word. You know, people have even used the term uh, bibliodolatry as if we worship the Bible. Well, now listen, the Bible is made up with pages and ink. You can get a red one. You can get a black one. You can have different sizes and so forth. And of course, there's plenty of perversions out there as well. But what I'm saying is, yes, we're not talking about the paper and ink, but I'm telling you what that book communicates, the words, not just the, the ideas, but the very words of God. Jesus said to the devil, he didn't say as it were, the Bible says something like this. He said, it is written. Now that speaks first of all of its authority as well as its preservation. And I'm going to tell you, when he spoke, the devil had to listen. Do you know I can quote the same book Jesus quoted? Now, it just so happened Jesus was quoting his own word, but I have access to the word of God. Now, listen carefully. Here's a familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, listen to verse 13. Neither is there any creature which is not made manifest in his sight. But all things are open and naked unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, when I quote verse 13, immediately what comes to your mind is God. That is, all things are open and naked unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There's no creature that is not manifest in his sight. You say, well, wait a minute. Is he, he just mentioned the word of God in verse 12, so the antecedent to that would, would have to be the Bible. So is he talking about Bible or is he talking about himself? And the answer is yes. Amen. 
Do you realize God so associates himself with his word that he literally says the word is powerful and there's no creature that is not manifest in the sight of the word of God. In Galatians chapter 8, God through the apostle Paul is referring back to an Old Testament passage there in, uh, in, in the time of Abraham and he says the scripture foreseeing that this would take place. Well, now, doesn't God, isn't God the one that foresees? But it says the Scripture foreseeing. You go over to Romans chapter 9, he's referring to the incident when God sent Moses uh, to Pharaoh and the final judgment before he drew the line when the moraine of the cattle took place and he was going to uh, bring the other judgments and so forth. And it says in that passage that the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Now, God spoke to Pharaoh through Moses, but it said the Scripture spoke to him. You see, God takes the attribute that I would attribute to him, and he applies it to this book. Now, that tells me that God expects me to stand and answer to a book just like I answer to him, because this book is the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. It doesn't just give me access to the Word of God. I don't have to go search it and say, boy, I'm going to find some things in here that God has to say from the very first Genesis 1-1 to Revelation chapter 22 and everything in between is the Word of God. And by the way, there is no other Word of God. It's the only one. So Jesus establishes now His authority. We know that the authority of Jesus is equated with the authority of the book. Let me tell you, this culture would be a whole lot better off today. They would operate a whole lot more smoothly. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about salvation. We'll talk about going to heaven through the blood of Jesus. But I'm just talking about the world itself. If it would stop and it would say, there is one book on this earth that is an authority that tells me exactly what God says, and he's the one that made man. He's the ultimate authority, and everything else fell below. This world would be a far better place. You know, everywhere this book's ever gone, it's improved. Right. You go to the heathen place where people are running around, dancing around a campfire in a loincloth, uh, eating each other and killing each other with spears, and you bring a Bible in, and the place improves. Yeah. And then you educate those cannibals, turn them into college professors, they get rid of the Bible, and it goes back right just like it was before. Yes, now, I see, first of all, the expression of authority. But then I look a little further in this chapter. And I notice that Jesus now, as he has entered into his ministry, and he goes in verse 16, as he walks by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now I see there the execution of authority. Jesus now is speaking to these disciples, demonstrating he has a right to their life. Come ye after me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He literally is saying to these two men who have already received the Messiah in John chapter 1, they already saw him, knew who he was, but they just thought, okay, that's wonderful, the Messiah came. Now these two born-again individuals, Jesus comes to and says, come ye after me, and I'll make you. Now, first of all, he has authority to demand my life. I mean, he saved me, not only created me, then he saved me. He executes his authority when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. You know, it's legitimate for God to call me and tell me to do whatever I, what he wants me to do, right? He created me, then he saved me. If God says, here's what you ought to do, then I ought to do it. Isn't it remarkable that God says, I beseech you to do it? Isn't it remarkable that he comes to James and John, and it's almost as if it's a request. It's not, but he says it in such a sense, I'm giving you a chance to come after me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. Now, you know, sometimes we jump ahead, and we think, boy, I'm going to be a fisher of men. God's going to send me after people and be a spokesman for God. And it's not just talking about preachers. Every Christian, he wants us to be fishers of men. He calls upon our life and he says, look, I want to speak through you to the world. That's what he's told the church. He has every right to this tongue and every right to our facilities. He's God and he calls on us to do that. But we might look at that and say, well, boy, I can't fish for men. What could I say? How could I do it? Notice he didn't come to them and tell them to make themselves fishers of men. 
Their only command was to come after him. He said, then I'll take care of making you a fisher of men. First and foremost today, you need to come after him. His first execution of authority is that he demands you come after him. Now, it begins by you receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me remind you again of a similar passage. John chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, For as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become a son of God. You know, a person can't save themselves. You can't just decide, I'm going to go to heaven any more than you decide to fly. But you can line up with what God says is the way to heaven, and he gives you power to become a son of God. Only God has power to save. You simply respond, yes, God, I'll receive it. And God says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You understand God executes his authority by calling upon me, first of all, you must be born again. He executes his authority by calling on the believer, come ye after me, and God says, my power will take care of the rest. I need to respond to his authority. So I see an expression of his authority. God's transferred it to his word or equated it with his word. I see the execution of his authority, and then God calls upon uh, me to respond. You know, by the way, did you know when God says something and he tells you to do it, you can do the impossible. Right. You know, I think about Lazarus. Here he has been laying in the grave for four days. He's a dead man. They even recognize that when Jesus came and even intimated that he might raise Jesus from the dead, his sister who desperately wanted to see him, and they said, pull the stone away. He said, well, Jesus, you don't want to do that because by now... Rigor mortis is set in. You know, it reminds me of the world that we live in. As I look around at the world, I see a bunch of people walking and talking and they're around, but spiritually, rigor mortis is set in. They have no concept of God. They know nothing about morals or right or any concept of what it takes to please the Lord. They think the only thing that exists in the Bible is the Ten Commandments and they don't even keep those. I mean, man is running around to and fro with no clear direction in his life. He doesn't know where to go. He's dead spiritually. Jesus walks up to that place where a man's body is rotting and stinking and far beyond just initial rigor mortis. He is beginning to decay away. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Well, now, he called Lazarus by name. He spoke with authority. Now, let's just suppose you tried that. If I was even in a hard sleep and you came up to me and said, Pastor, come forth. You better rattle a chicken box or something, you know, right? I mean, I'm liable to just stay right there, right? I might not even wake up. Certainly if I was outright dead and you came up and said, Pastor, come forth, you don't have any authority to wake the dead. But he told a dead man, it wasn't a matter of did Lazarus want to get up. Lazarus couldn't get up, but when Jesus told him to get up, he could get up. The voice of authority. What about the man who had a withered hand? He's standing there that day. Jesus looks around the crowd, and he just sees a man with a withered hand. You know what that means? I mean, for years, the muscle had just shriveled up. There's nothing but skin that had wrapped around his bone. I'm sure you could see his joint, and there's no blood flow into that thing. It's just sitting there. It's live flesh, but he couldn't move it. If I came up to him and said, sir, I would like you to stick your hand out so I can shake it. Well, he could stick the other one out, but he couldn't move that one. It's withered. It wasn't a matter if he wanted to do it. I wouldn't be offended if he didn't because I'd say he doesn't have that ability. But you know what Jesus told the man? He said, stretch forth thine hand. Now, he didn't heal his hand and then say, stretch it forth. He just told the man stretch forth thy hand. And you know what the man did? What he couldn't do. He stretched it forth. You realize the same Jesus who told that man to stretch forth his hand, the same Jesus who told the Lazarus to come out of the grave and other instances we could talk about today, the same Jesus who did that is the one who says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And you can respond to his voice. 
He's the one that says, I, come unto me and I will make you fishers of men and you can respond because he called you. Right. It only takes the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who calleth who also will do it. Now that is the voice of God. I remember Jesus one time being up on the brow of a hill. The time had not come. People decided we don't want to hear Jesus anymore. We're tired of his preaching. He offended us. He said before Abraham was, I am, and he's claiming to be God. Pick up stones. We're going to take care of this man once for all. And you know what Jesus did? He walked right through the midst of them because he has authority. Now, Jesus executed his authority. In fact, many times when Jesus worked on this earth, he said, look, I didn't have to do it this way. I didn't have to show you what I was doing, but I wanted you to know that Jesus hath power on this earth to execute his authority, that you might know he's the Son of God. Now, I see the expression of his authority and the execution of his authority, and then I look in this chapter and I notice the exercise of his authority. Now, in many areas, in fact, we read one in our text, you notice, first of all, he has authority over doctrine. Look at verse 22. They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You know who the scribes were? The scribes were extremely educated in the law. Some of them memorized the first five books. They well knew every jot and tittle and aspect of all the law, plus all of the commentaries that the Jewish rabbis had written. Very familiar with it. And they would get up and they would teach the people the law. They would get up and say, here is what the law says. But people would listen and they would say, okay, these people are just reflecting to us what they've learned in the Word of God. When Jesus got up and taught the same word, they said something's different. This man is not speaking about the Word of God. He is speaking the Word of God. They recognized his authority. You know, people today will argue about the Bible, and they'll say, well, you know, of course, you've got your evolutionist crowd. Uh, the first 11 chapters of the Bible is just a bunch of myths and fairy tales that were accumulated, and maybe Moses didn't even write that part, and uh, there's just, you know, nothing really that helpful. But you get to chapter 12, and you introduce Abraham, and it's probably not accurate history, but there's some good lessons in there, and you can teach it to little kids to help them with morality, even if they're positive. And the negative, they even say, so far as let's get rid of the book. But you understand that the approach to the Bible, that it is just some uh, helpful book of morals and been written by a number of men over time with all kinds of contradictions, well, that shows very much ignorance about this book. This book is far more than that. First of all, men have been trying to tear it down for years, and no one has yet to do it. I was recently talking to a Bible translator. He's going over to... Uh, I think it's Burma or somewhere, I can't remember, uh, where there's all kinds of tribal languages. And, you know, there might be uh, 300 different languages in that area with one main language. And there's two or three different translations of the Bible in certain languages, but they might not be but 2,000 people that even speak that language. And they'll spend years translating it so they can read it for themselves. Now, I don't believe they do that with Shakespeare. They don't do that with Mark Twain. They don't do that with uh, uh, different authors that you could name. No other book is worthy of that kind of uh, meticulous translation because it's so important that God would put an authority in their hand, the Word of God. Now, he has authority over doctrine. He knew when, he, when they heard his doctrine that it was the Word of God. You know, Jeremiah was concerned about the false prophets. He said, Lord, what are they going to do? These uh, false prophets are preaching peace to the people. They're telling the Israelites that the Babylonians are going to leave. They're telling them not going into captivity. I've been preaching all these years that it's going to happen. They're telling them it's not. Now, I know it is, but I'm worried these people won't listen. And you know what God said to Jeremiah in chapter 23 of that book? He said, he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? Now, the chaff is the false stuff. The wheat is the real thing. You know, I think any normal person that had anything to do with agriculture could tell the difference in a pile of chaff that the wind had blown and the real stuff. But he went a little further than that. He said, what is the chaff to the wheat? Is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that breaketh the rock 
in pieces. Hey, don't get frustrated today that the world won't listen to this book. Do you know it's not my job to convince them to listen to it? It is the job of the Son of God who spoke on that day and they recognized its authority. Let me tell you what to do with it. Just give it faithfully. Amen. You give this book faithfully. People can tear it down. They can argue about it. I have seen, especially young people, teenagers, they're far more transparent than adults. Yeah. Adults are just good liars. But a, a teenagers, yeah. uh, you talk with them and they're just honest with you and just up front. And I've seen teenagers who have heard this stuff in a classroom or whatever it might be. I'd preach the gospel. They'd come up to me afterwards and they want to argue about it. Where did Cain get his wife? How did Jonah get swallowed by a whale? You know, they read this little stuff. I didn't try to explain to them in detail where Cain got his wife. I didn't try to explain to them in detail how scientifically a, a whale could swallow Jonah and so forth. You know what I did? I'd give them the gospel. I'd just say, well, okay, well, let's talk about that. But first of all, let me, does, do you believe you're a sinner? Do you know that God says the penalty for sin is that there's an eternal hell? Well, now their premise is, well, I don't even believe the Bible. No problem. Let me just tell you what the book you don't believe says. And again and again, and I've seen them at the end, not telling me I don't believe it, but I'm just not willing to receive it. And then, of course, in other cases, I've seen them trust Christ. Amen. You see, you just give this book, and God will put his stamp of approval upon it. Right. He'll put the amen behind it. This right. book is powerful. It is an authority. Jesus demonstrated it. But you know, not only doctrine... Very interesting here. Notice he has power over demons. Now, I notice first of all in verse 23. It says, There was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? So here he's in the middle of preaching. He's explaining the word of God. And a man, who is obviously demon-possessed, interrupts the meeting and says, What are we going to do, Jesus? You're the Son of God. He had multiple demons in him. What well, Jesus said in verse 25, Jesus rebuked him saying, Hold thy peace, come out of him. Now in the Greek, that means shut up and get out of here. Right. Okay? When Jesus says, Hold thy peace, come out of him, the demon had no choice. Right. He held his peace and he came out. Well, then I notice again in verse 34, He healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Uh, I notice again down in verse 39, he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Now first of all, why did Jesus tell the devils to be quiet? You know what they were saying? They were saying, Jesus, we know who you are. You're the Son of God. You know, some people think if, if God would just show me a vision and he would come down to me and say, I'm real and the Bible is true, then I'd believe him. No, you wouldn't. Right. You'd say, I just had a bad dream. It was just happening in my mind. Whatever. You wouldn't believe that. Right. Some other says, if I could just talk to my grandma again and if, I, if God would let me see one of my dead relatives or something, boy, that, I'd know then that God's in this and it's real. Well, the devil now, supernaturally, I'm talking about a man. They knew there was a supernatural incident taking place with a demon-possessed man. That's Jesus. He's the Son of God. And Jesus said, be quiet. You know why? God doesn't need the devil's help to get the Word of God out. Amen. Do you know our churches today, if they would recognize that God doesn't need the devil's help to get out the Word of God, we'd be better off. Oh, well, if we're going to relate to these young people, we've got to take the world's music. If we're going to relate to these people with false doctrine, we've got to bring their preachers up and put them on the stage. If we're going to relate to these folks and get them, we just got to have a little help from the devil's system so we can reach them. No, we don't. All we need is the unadulterated Word of God and let it do its work. Now, he has power over the demons. Now, I'm not this morning thinking that a whole of you are struggling with demon possession. Got a question about a couple of you, but uh, I don't think that's your big struggle. But let me tell you, even though I might not be dealing with a demon-possessed person this morning, I have a society that is demon-influenced. Right. You see, the devil still influences this world. He's called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I mean, he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the one that the Bible is referring to that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, powers, and what it is, false authorities. He's behind them. 
If Jesus could simply tell the devil to leave, well, we know he's a defeated foe. He has authority over the biggest enemy. You know, have you ever heard the question, why did God uh, let the devil exist? And, and, and if you talk to a person that doesn't know much about the Bible, uh, well, who is the devil? Well, God is the great force for good, and the devil is the great force for evil. God is real powerful, and the devil is like right up here, but not quite as powerful as God. You're missing it. God is infinitely more powerful than the devil. If I could use the analogy, I am not infinitely power, powerful. Infinitely good looking, but not infinitely powerful. But I got a little ant next to me. I'm a lot more powerful than that ant. So I could squash it. Now, that wouldn't be a true analogy because I have a limit to my power. God's power and authority has no limit. And in the same comparison, the devil still does have the ant limitation. So he's infinitely more powerful even than I would be of that ant. These not, they're not co-equal fighting against one another. God has a pawn that he has put here for a purpose, allowed him. He's a self-made creature. He fell. God said, here's the consequence, and ultimately is going to receive more glory because God's going to demonstrate his authority over the devil. He didn't have any problem casting out these devils. He didn't have any problem saying, get thee hence. He had authority over doctrine, over the devils, and then over disease. Notice, if you would, in verse 29. It says, forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they enter into the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. But Simon's wife, mother, lay sick of a fever. And anon they tell him of her. He came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. And she ministered unto them. Now, this woman had a fever. That was not an evident problem. In other words, it wasn't a withered hand. It wasn't, she wasn't blind. It wasn't something that you could see. Obviously, they didn't even have a thermometer. I guess you could have felt her for it or something. But she had a fever, and she was grievously sick. But it wasn't a, anything that dealt with the outside. The fever was on the inside. Jesus came in and rebuked the fever. Now, as authority over disease. Now, that doesn't surprise me that Jesus could heal a disease, but it does remind me of this. One of the first things God does in all of His miracles illustrate spiritual truth. He deals, first of all, on the inside. See, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It wouldn't be that remarkable today if God simply came to an alcoholic and gave him power over drink. There's been a handful of folks without even getting saved who by discipline and maybe AA or whatever have gotten where they don't drink anymore. That is possible within human reigns to do that, though often it doesn't work. It does sometimes. Now, if God simply dealt on the outside and said, I'm going to get this alcoholic to quit being an alcoholic, I'm going to clean him up, that wouldn't be much more remarkable than what man can accomplish. God just do it a whole lot easier. But if God can go down on the inside, not just work on the outside on one problem, but can go down and change a man and make him a completely new creature, that demonstrates his authority. He deals with the heart. Man's problem today is not that he drinks, not that he's immoral, not that he worships idols. Now, he'll have to answer to God for every one of those. He'll have to answer to God for his sexual sin, for his drugs and alcohol, for his meanness, for his stealing. All of that we have to answer to God for. Without Jesus, yes, we'll stand for it. But he doesn't deal with those individual issues. He goes down and gets what causes it, the heart. And he speaks at it. But now, don't get me wrong. Once he cleans up that heart, there's one other thing I notice in this passage before we're done, is I notice the evidence of his authority. Look down to verse 40. There came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now this man doesn't just have a fever. He's got leprosy. Leprosy is always a picture of sin. His sins had some consequences. Now, again, the leprosy is the picture of the sin. No doubt he was a sinner as well. But, you know, when you had leprosy, the first thing to go were the ends of your fingers. You start losing them. And then your nose probably be next. 
pieces of your ear, everything like the extremities, your toes. And then it started working its way back, and of course, eventually, leprosy would just completely reach a vital organ, and you die. Now, this person is not like somebody with a fever. They got an evident problem. You don't have to look far in our society to see that people have evident problems. Even if you don't have leprosy today, you've got a fever of sin, and you need the Lord Jesus Christ to wash it away, but most of us have seen the leprosy. You've seen the consequences of your sin. You know that there's no peace in your heart and you're struggling with direction. You realize that you've reaped and now you, or you've sown and now you're reaping. Well, this leper came to Jesus and said, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. He recognized he, had, he was dealing with an authority. Hey, if you recognize the power of this book and recognize Jesus can do something about it, you're real close to getting something done about it. Right. Now, he went so far, Jesus moved with compassion, put his hand put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. Now let me explain something briefly. In the law, if you were a Jew, you met a man that was a leper. You were strictly forbidden to touch a leper because a leper, obviously the disease issue was there and that was, they didn't understand disease, but God did well ahead of science. And he said, don't touch the leper. That's how it's going to be transferred. But it also said, if you touch him, His uncleanness will be transferred to you. Not just the disease, but the ceremonial uncleanness will transfer to you. You're forbidden to touch him because you'll become unclean. Now, Jesus was a Jew, and Jesus never broke the law. Jesus now put forth his hand and touched a leper. Legally, we have a question. Jesus is not supposed to be unclean. He's supposed to be a Nazarite. I mean, he is, he is the Son of God. He's never going to violate a single law, and he didn't. Perfect. How can he not now become unclean? Because there's one difference in Jesus and the rest of all those Jews. When a Jew who was a sinner touched another leper, God says his uncleanness will be transferred to you. When Jesus, the Son of God, touched the unclean, his cleanness got transferred to the leper. Because think about it. He ain't supposed to touch a leper. He didn't. When he put forth his hand and he touched him, he was no longer a leper. Now, do you know Jesus identified himself with sinners? He reached out and touched sinners on the cross. You think about it that day as he died on the cross. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but get this part. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he had made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Peter 2, 24, Christ also bare our sin in his own body on the tree. Now here the Lord Jesus is dying on a cross. The nails are in his hand, the blood's running down his face, the crown of thorns on his head, his visage marred more than any other man, whipped to a bloody pulp. He's on the cross, and God Almighty turns the light out. Darkness over the land for three hours. At the end of those three hours, Jesus cried with a loud voice. He said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took the sinner's place. He literally bore every act of adultery. He bore it upon his own body on the tree. Every murder, he bore it upon his own body on the tree. Every theft, he took it upon his own body on the tree. Every act of lying, cheating, stealing, pride, arrogance, gossip, whatever it is, Jesus bore it. But now, if I had borne that sin, as I deserve because I'm a sinner, I'd be a sinner. I'd have to go to hell. When Jesus bore my sin, he didn't become a sinner and go to hell. He took care of the sin. He bore it and dealt with it, and made it possible that any man can have his sin dealt with and go to heaven. Jesus touched, he took the sinner's place, became sin for us. Now, he wasn't a sinner. He couldn't have died for his own. He's God, but he died for mine. You say, well, did it work? Was it satisfactory? He came out of the grave the third day to demonstrate that truly what we thought took place surely did.
he was able to take the sinner's place, and God put his stamp of approval upon him. Years ago, Dr. H.A. Ironside was preaching for the Salvation Army. It used to be a very uh, solid uh, gospel preaching organization years ago. That was in the early 1900s. He was preaching as a young man out on the street and just had a handful of folks gathered around giving the gospel. When he got done, a man came up to him and said, Son, I'm a teacher over at such and such university. Ironside, well-read man, knew of the guy, heard his name and knew that he was an agnostic and a lecturer and got up and gave talks all the time on why the Bible wasn't true and Christianity was a farce and all this type of thing. But he happened to walk by, us in Chicago, I believe it was, and he heard Ironside and he went up to him. He could tell he was a, a pretty intelligent man. And he said, son, I'd be willing to come back out here next week. You're a Christian. You believe you knew all this stuff. He said, I want to debate you in front of these people. So we'll come out here on the street and I'll do a debate. He figured Ironside would maybe intimidated or whatever. Well, he was intimidated. He was just a young boy, you know, in his 20s or something. And he said, well, sir, I'll tell you what, I'd be willing to do that on one condition. He said, if you would be willing to bring with you to the debate one person who used to be a drunkard or a harlot or a gambler or whose life was a mess and they heard your lecture and it changed their life and now they're a productive citizen. He said, now, wait a minute. If you'll bring one, I'll bring a hundred that have heard my message of Jesus and have seen their life transferred that way. Right. Needless to say, the debate didn't take place. The man turned around and walked away because nobody's ever had their life transformed from an unproductive uh, sinner who's headed to hell with nothing but despair because they heard there's no Bible, no God, and whatever other kind of agnosticism they want to promote. Yeah. But many of folks, even ignorant people who didn't know a whole lot, but they knew this book, said Jesus saves. Amen. Sin's black, hell's hot, and Jesus saves, right. and lives have been changed. Yeah. There is an authority on this earth. I don't have to convince you, but God can. Amen. When they heard him, they knew. And this book stands as the authority. Let's have a word of prayer today.